the final chapters in this book because uh, in choosing to use these in evotional, there were only 30 of them, I believe. Yeah, 30. And when I first started them, it was fantastic because the Lord seemed to speak through them and say exactly what I think that you know He would sit sit down and talk to both of us about and to share from His heart. And then as I began to notice that it was getting towards the end, I thought, oh wow, what will I do? You know, will I, you know, reread these over again, 30 each month, you know, redoing them? And, you know, that was kind of a no. <laughs> so when I prayed, I, I talked to God about it and I thought, you know, there is something that, you know, he kind of impressed upon me that I'm still praying about because I, I wanted to say no and I didn't yet because I didn't really want to take the plunge into doing it. But there's a series of posts that I've written before called Jesus Said that's based on the Sermon on the Mount. And to me, the Sermon on the Mount is the, some people say the quintessential, but it would be the ultimate challenge greater than my utmost versus highest or any other devotional that I have seen that are very impactful upon life. And to share them as a devotional would be interesting, <laughs> to say the least. I have no, I, I'm pretty sure I know which direction it'll go, but I have no idea how it'll turn out. So, at the end of these, Speak, God, Speak to My Heart God, from K. Arthur, in order to maintain the same integrity, then that is the direction that I'm praying to go with, choosing both Matthew and Luke in the Sermon on the Mount. I'm kind of getting a thrill thinking about it. <laughs> so, reading this and sharing as God would speak, when you don't know where to run, what difference does it make if I'm not in the Word of God on a daily basis? So you don't know the Bible well, but you're not a preacher or a teacher. What difference does it make? You read the Word of God a little, you're here and there in the Bible, but you don't get much out of it. What difference does it make? It makes a critical difference. All I can tell you, and I can tell you from my own experience as well as the experience of others, that once you're in the Word consistently, once you've learned how to dig out its treasures of truth for yourself, you will experience the incredible revolutionary difference. The difference between a, hi, how are you, by the way, I've been meaning to tell you, relationship with God, and a deep intimacy with your Heavenly Father. It's the difference between a panic attack in the unexpected jolts of life and a supernatural peace in the worst storms that you experience. It's a difference between confusion and quiet confidence. It's a difference between a dogmatic, hard-nosed, and sometimes belligerent stance and moving in a gentle and patient but uncompromising way. It's a difference between a restless, I don't know what's missing, but something is kind of feeling, and a surety that all is well with your soul. It's a difference between running off in a thousand different directions and knowing that this is what you are to do. Spending time with God and His Word, knowing Him, His ways, and understanding Him and what He has said gives you a sense of stability. Those who know God through His Word and through daily intimacy with Him retain the healthy fear, respect, and trust of Him that God says we are to have. Yet at the same time, that unhealthy dread of what God might do if they submit to Him disappears for they know His character and comprehend the depth of His love. A perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. But when you know him and his word, you know where to run for refuge. You know where to rest your case. You know who has all the facts. And this knowledge eases all the tension as you enter the rest of faith. When you spend time daily with the God and when you spend time daily with God in his word, your faith grows. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10:7. Anyone who wants to know God's Word intimately can, children, teens, and adults. Those who do begin their personal study of the Bible on a daily basis, live by what God says, will soon discover that being in the Word is like gathering manna every day. It is food for life. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you to understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord, Deuteronomy 8.3. They will discover the sufficiency, the all-sufficiency of the word of God. 
We say that we believe the Bible is the Word of God. We say that we believe it is without error and contradiction, thus holding to its inerrancy. But do we hold to its sufficiency? Is it all in all comprehensive? If we say something is sufficient, we mean it is adequate. You need nothing in addition to it. Do we realize that the solution to every problem, every hurt, every dilemma can be found between the covers of His Holy Word? in its precepts, principles, examples, commands, promises, warnings, and teachings? Do we partake of it daily so we can be nourished and made strong, prepared for every situation of life? Do we dwell on its precepts and wrestle with how they are to be lived out in our relationships, in our businesses, and even in our social lives? Do we run to its pages and to its authors for wisdom and counsel when we don't know what to do, where to turn, or how we are going to survive? Do we bring our questions, our frustrations to God's inerrant word? Do we give him the time to speak to us? Do we wait, as Habakkuk did, to see what the Lord will speak to us so that we might walk by faith? Or do we run to the arm of flesh and the counsel of men and the latest theories and philosophies, even Oprah? Do we seek out the popular counselors, speakers, and writers of our day, listening to their philosophies, evaluating their successes, and then seeing if we want to apply it to our situation? Or do we first wait upon the Lord, then stay or go at His direction? The Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, Proverbs. The word fear means a reverential trust and awesome respect. If we really respect God for who He is, then we will make listening to Him a priority. If we fear Him, we'll trust what He says and live accordingly, no matter what the situation. Then we'll have His wisdom for every situation of life. Let me share with you something Charles Stanley said in his book, A Touch of Wisdom. The scriptures are God's wisdom. They teach us who God is and reveal how he acts and thinks. They instruct us to distinguish right from wrong, and they give clear guidelines for practical living. His word is counsel from heaven for life on earth, revealing the Father's omniscient heart to help us walk victoriously in all our endeavors. When learned and consistently applied, God's word fastens firmly together the disjointed portions of our lives our work, our family, our relationships, our dreams, our thoughts, our words, our deeds, in the sturdy framework of divine wisdom. This is the foundation on which to build a life that can courageously withstand the inevitable storms of criticism, pain, loss, temptation, and success. There is no other foundation, beloved. No other is needed because the Word of God is totally sufficient. If you, like Habakkuk, will embrace the Word of God and bring every dilemma and lay it at the feet of the God's word, then you'll find yourself walking with hinds feet and not slipping. Whoosh! <laughs> as everyone knows, you should read. <laughs> and as you read, you should study. And as you study, you should apply. And as you apply, you should make it a part of your life. And as you make it a part of your life, you may find that God will lead, direct, guide, abide, provide for you in every circumstance or situation so that you will know that it's not just a word of God but that God is alive and there is a living God who is at work both in you, about you, around you, and in his word.